You good? All right, let's get this show on the road. Uh, I'm Alex Minern. Uh, I like to call myself a whatever end pragmatist because whatever end you got a problem on, I got a solution. I work on all different kinds of the stack. And while I like to read theory and wax philosophical, I like to pull it down and get down to brass tacks and be very pragmatic. Um, and that's my Twitter handle, so you can follow me on there and at me. It's been a little uh, more active lately, but sometimes I go in hibernation. And I currently work for Civic Actions. Uh, I didn't have time exactly to, to brand it well, so I'll put the logo you see on there in a kind of brought to you by Civic Actions fashion as we go throughout the the uh, presentation, but I promise to brand it better uh, later. And uh, next time we do it, uh, and that's a link to the career section. We do have some open positions. I think a senior DevOps position, if you're interested in that, you can talk to me about it. Um, do a lot of Drupal work, uh, do work with the government. I work for Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services, some Drupal apps. Um, and then as I was thinking about how to arrange the slides for this presentation, uh, thought of many ways, but I did it probably the laziest way possible, which is just taking the title and breaking it down into four sections. So we're gonna, gonna go on a breadcrumb trail all the way uh, to using Cypress, but we'll get there at the, at the end. But I think it's kind of important to tell you the journey as we go on. And each of these um, intro slides, each of the section will be quote slides, because I just start with quotes. Uh, so I was thinking of making my own definition for testing, and that's kind of pretentious, so I just uh, lifted one from the internet. And I like this definition from a place called WordNick. Um, I kind of like it's focusing on presence, quality, truth. I like that, and then I kind of like the trial, like the idea that you're writing uh, your tests and your, you know, your honor, this foreman put data is out of order. <laughs> there, we got one laugh that'll maybe uh, encourage me to do. More bad jokes uh, later, but writing tests can sometimes be boring, so it's kind of fun to have that imagery. And before I get too far, I bring up the kind of contractually obligated slide anytime you're doing a talk on testing at a conference, you want to bring up the testing pyramid. So I lifted this version of it from uh, Martin Fowler, a very smart guy, who wrote that article. I encourage you to go read it. And I guess it originally came from a guy named Mike Cohn in a book called Succeeding with Agile. And the general idea is, you know, at the base of the pyramid, you have your foundation, which are unit tests. Uh, they're very isolated. Uh, they run faster. Uh, and then as you go up, service tests, integration, you have a lot of different names. And then you go up to UI le level, and I'll call that end-to-end -end testing with Cypress is where you most commonly see it. Uh, now, and that's more integrated, so full on then test, you're you know, testing everything as it is in production. Um, and so it tends to be slower, more brittle, can break. So that's why you want to have more uh, unit tests. And for our example here, Cypress is an end solution, PHP unit all the way at the bottom, but can do all the levels of testing. And in the middle, there'd be dragons. And I'm not going to try to go through stub, spice, mocks, all that type of stuff, but people have fist fights and debate for days on end about you know, what's in between a unit test and a fully end to end test. Here's another version of the testing pyramid, because there's plenty, plenty of versions. Um, and this comes from a course for QA uh, people. It's kind of outside of the traditional uh, dev realm that I'm in. So it's a, an interesting course you can take. It's, like you can go there and it's like eight bucks a month you can study for this exam, but it's it's like the primo thing if you're a QA tester. Um, so I thought it was interesting they broke it down into more levels and they're kind of saying, you know, over here, like who who is the test for? Or maybe they're saying like who should write it. Ideally, you know, everything should be cross-functional. You don't have hard uh, lines in between a QA team and a dev team, but uh, it is, you know, uh, useful to think that you're not probably going to show your clients the unit test, but you can show them the acceptance test and you know, maybe help you write. Uh, and the, the dream is to get them to write the test, but that never works. Uh, so that's just another version. From the same course, you know, this is the inverted pyramid, which is can be very bad. Um, they have money over here saying, you know, it's going to cost you a lot uh, money. Uh, but I always think with Drupal it's kind of interesting because we're oftentimes working on other units of code and we're doing a lot of integration. So I kind of was like, why not have acceptance tests? So at one point I thought, oh yeah, this is great. 
like these people are wrong, it should be flipped. And you know, I was like, oh hell yeah, and then I'll bring the Kool-Aid man in here. But this is obviously a joke, because the Kool-Aid man <laughs> respects unit test, and if he does this, he'll bust through your wall. Um, so don't, don't do this, uh, this will set yourself up for failure because you'll eventually, the acceptance test won't be running and people will be broken and then people will stop writing those tests. Test. So you want to have the pyramid the other way. And the last thing I'll say, uh, this kind of comes from Gherkin syntax, right, it was starting right, how these types of tests, given when then. It's also called a range act assert, you'll see more commonly. So you generally you know, want to set something up like logging in seeing a database, then you go through a series of actions, uh, navigating, filling out a form, so forth, and then you assert things. And so you see access denied, or you see the forms successful, and that completes the testing part. So your Drupal site, brought to you by Civic Active. And um, for this quote, uh, I was kind of having trouble thinking of what uh, to do. So uh, this is a thing that I remember, I don't know if this is Still exactly around, but do people know this slogan? You've heard it before. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But it's uh, this was I actually thought it was come for the code on the Drupal.org website. It's actually come for the software. I looked in the Wayback Machine. So this is like 2010 to 2015. They had this on the website, and then like kind of who's the message for? I think you know back in the day it was basically just PHP developers. You know, um, uh, back in the mid 2000s, everyone was kind of creating their own framework. And so Drupal is very helpful, come for the code. And then uh, ten, about 10 years ago, uh, that links to um, Dries's, Dries Down Under. So we start, you know, kind of marketing Drupal better. And at that point, it was, Drupal was for mid-market. It's kind of comparing it to WordPress. Um, you know, it's interesting, it wasn't seen as enterprise at that point. He had a little pyramid chart on there, kind of ironically, but with the different markets. And then fast forward uh, five years, you have Drupal is for ambitious digital experiences, which I kind of always think like Zoolander, like uh, the blue steel Drupal is for ambitious digital experiences. And that's kind of <laughs> very corporate and you know, you're targeting site core and executives and people with digital, ambitious digital experiences. I kind of like now it's back to site builders because that's kind of the original, you know, it's no code solution, uh, got to support the site builder. And so now I think we're getting to more like Webflow. I don't know if people have used Webflow or you always kind of use Webflow plus another thing. But I'm redoing my personal site on there, so it's very easy to use. And I think that's kind of the, the target, um, kind of going back uh, to that level hosted this type of service. Uh, anyway, so um, your Drupal site, what does it have? Uh, it has lots of users, so we'll get into testing users with Cypress and nice ways you can do that. Um, has you know WYSIWYGs, a bunch of different field types, uh, autocomplete fields. These can be kind of tricky to test. Uh, iframes. I'm going to admit to you, Cypress is, is not very good with iframes, but iframes are things you commonly have to two test. And this is a, a past job I had with a donation <coughs> form. It was a bit tricky to reach in there and test that. And then JSON API. Now we have a lot of the couple of sites, uh, so you can test. You can test JSON, objects, data, whatever. Cypress is just JavaScript, uh, just as well as HTML. So you can write API tests with it. And then different types of Drupal tests. So this is just some output from uh, Drush Gen on the uh, test level. So there's basically five different levels of tests uh, going up from unit level to kernel to browser to web driver to Nightwatch. I think Nightwatch is kind of the most similar to Cypress, although with web drivers you can do kind of the same thing. Uh, I want to look more into Nightwatch, uh, and that link will go explain more about the different types. Uh, and then a bit on Drupal CI, I kind of forgot uh, this was in my uh, proposal a little bit, so I'll just uh, sneak in a very text textual slide. Um, but there's a lot, lot to Drupal CI, I don't want to go over in this talk. Um, still on Drupal.org, but it is interesting moving to GitLab, uh, so that links to the, the overall roadmap. Uh, but it'll be interesting because you'll be able to configure more of the test runner. I'm you know, still deciding how to do that. Uh, you can look locally in that file, which is actually a PHP file masquerading as a, a shell script, kind of interestingly. Uh, and that'll go through how the tests are run. Um, 
Um, like I said, Nightwatch I think is the closest. Uh, to Drupal, um, functional JavaScript. I was trying to write a uh, contrib module test uh, with that and use Selenium. And I actually was trying to make this DDEV add-on, but it's a very good uh, thing. Came out kind of last fall. Uh, but up until that point, it was kind of hard to test, run the test locally, uh, setting up Selenium and stuff like that. It's so, uh, created by a guy, uh, Mosh Witzman, I'm probably not pronouncing Mosh. that right. Mosh, yeah. But very prominent. Mosh Witzman, yeah. Yeah, very prominent in Drupal, good guy. Also made Drupal test traits, which allow you to better test a fully populated site. So that's a good uh, link to go to if you uh, need to do that. And then the easy way. So uh, I just kind of asked for inspiration from, from the internet for what was a good quote uh, for this kind of contrasting against the hard way. And it gave me back Franz Kafka. So he said, in, in the struggle between yourself and the world, second the world. And so I'm gonna tell you a story where I did second the world. Um, so Cypress is more popular now, but it's still kind of not taking over Selenium. Uh, so I'll tell you the story of my past with Behat and Selenium and me. Uh, and so here we have, uh, this is kind of how I got started with uh, indent testing. It was with a Drupal extension, it's BHAT Mink, um, behavior driven development. You know, the goal was the, the client was actually going to write the test. It's going to be amazing. I was sold on all of this. And with that, you know, sweet logo, what, what could go wrong? It's one of my favorite, uh, your redo of the DrupalCon. And so this just shows you the dependencies I started out with, inheriting a test suite. Um, and main point here, Cypress is one. Yeah, here I had like seven different dependencies and it was just hard to keep the versions in check, especially with like WebDriver uh, can, and like versions of Firefox or Chrome or Chromium. Uh, so a little later, I narrowed it down to, to three, getting better, but still not as good as one. And um, I dropped Drupal extension because that was a nice, you know, I was thinking about trying to do Cypress Drupal or something, but those are kind of fool's errands you end up getting in your way. Uh, so you can use them, but I find the more that you kind of get into writing the test, it's better to create your own you know, step definitions or custom commands. Um, here's a bit on the configuration. So I got fed up with trying to uh, run Selenium on Travis CI, so uh, Sauce Labs is nice enough to open it for open source projects. So I'm just showing here that uh, for whatever reason, I had to add some fake data uh, to just get the test to run. But I'm just kind of showing you types of configuration I never have to do with, with Cypress. Um, there's a lot of other configuration in that file. Um, and so here, I you know maybe a little bit over-engineered, maybe I had three different YAML files for VHAT. Uh, what's going on there? And I just wanted to show in this screenshot, uh, you know, run tests at different ports that accepts proxies. So uh, never have to think about ports or proxies. You know, so far with Cypress, um, it just very well runs the test. Uh, but there, I think, you know, thinking back, I was probably spending days on on uh, <laughs> messing around with why why wasn't connecting to Sauce Labs or something like that. Uh, and then get a little bit into the, the code. Uh, so Cypress is really good with retryability and not, not having to do this. But, uh, you know, there's a little step definition that ties this to this code. And so it's kind of sad and embarrassing if you have to say given I wait for Ajax because that's not really something that a user is, is doing, you know. They're not thinking I'm going to wait for the JavaScript to wait. And this function is just um, trying to you know, if any of this stuff is true before two seconds, then it, it will return. If not, then it'll just keep going. So if it doesn't take two seconds, and so you, oftentimes you're like, get, uh, you put this after each step or something, I think, and then you also have like given I wait five seconds or something. So I had a lot of problems with that. And I know other tools are getting better through try building and waiting. And then here's just clicking an element. So I'm gonna bring up locality of behavior. So it links to a little essay there. But the idea with locality behavior is that you're trying to, you know, when you look at the code, you know what it does. So it's not a bunch of smoke and mirrors where you're abstracting the functions, uh, you know, and the custom commands, and then you're going back and forth. And um, I had just a, a terrible time uh, sometimes debugging, uh, going into Mink and trying to figure out what what was actually running when the test was failing. 
and I find I just don't really have to do that with Cypress, and it's you know right in the test. I know it's failing. I know what to, to look for and to fix. And then here, uh, you know, here is the dream starting out. You know, look, that looks pretty clean, right? It's got a nice narrow outline. It's got the given one. Then you can tell where the variables are. Uh, you don't have to know any code. You know, uh, you can go over this with clients. Um, and then, but this is what it turns into. So I was training someone how to write tests. Like I didn't, I didn't write this, but the code's cut off for a reason because it, it's not. It kind of sucks uh, because you know to get away from some of these selectors, you have to go to page objects, which once again kind of moves, uh, you know, what you're doing to another place um, can be more distractive. Um, so not not the ideal that we started out with right with the last slide, and then. And trying to overwrite or extend the step definition, it is going back. So if you're trying to overwrite, like click, you can use object orientation to extend this, but you can't for this because this is a string. So, so what I had to do, and you probably do this better, but I just had a prefix. So it's kind of embarrassing to tell people, you know, instead of do like the, the logical word, you have to come up with your own. Uh, if some other, you know, step is taking that, um, so. Felt, felt like crying. Uh, so that was kind of the, the hard way. Um, so contrast with the, the easy way using Cypress, brought to you by Civic Actions. And uh, this quote wasn't hard to find because Cypress is just really great at developer experience, good at uh, marketing stuff. I even got this free t-shirt from a webinar, so now I'm, I'm wearing it, and you'll, you'll see that around the day. Uh, so I kind of think it like uh, you know Ruby on Rails, you know Laravel has a good developer experience. That's kind of what Cypress is doing to testing, um, addressing all those pain points that I was going over with you. And they're very good. Their documentation is very good about why you would use it, why you might not want to use it. So I encourage you to go uh, check that out. And I thought it'd just be good just to show you what happens when you first install it. And you can go and open the test runner. It's got a nice GUI uh, to walk you through what the tests are doing. So here I have some options. This is I took the screenshot from an actual project. So uh, if you just open it, I'll show you what happens. But you can also pass in options to the test runner uh, for an end-to-end -end test in the browser. To verify something, I don't know what it does, but it always always succeeds. So I've never seen that fail. And then you'll get to this screen. So you can do uh, two types of testing. I haven't done a lot of component testing, but that's more you know, React view level. Interestingly, there is a Twig component testing uh, project someone put up, I linked to there. So you, you can do Twig component testing. And I know Twig components are getting bigger in Drupal, um, just bigger in general. Um, but you might do that in the future. Uh, we're going to talk about end-to-end -end testing. And so it automatically will pick up what browsers you have locally. Uh, I have a Mac, so Safari is not on there, so I guess WebKit isn't supported yet, so that's kind of one of the downsides of Cypress browser support. Um, but it will pick up whatever you have, uh, like Chrome and Firefox. I've also seen like uh, Edge and stuff. It's kind of interesting. The developers will take screenshots on the website, but most people don't have Canary versions, so I don't know why they didn't fix that. But uh, I usually use Electron because it's bundled with Cypress. Um, and I linked down here to the Docker image, so that can be tricky on CI if you're trying to funnel the browser and some of those extensions that you know allow you to do the graphical user interface and stuff. Um, so I would use that if you're doing it in CI. But if you're just running it locally, you can use Electron uh, with no other dependencies. And then finally, we get to what what a test looks like. So this is uh, JavaScript. Uh, you have to group tests, traditionally you have the describe block and group the test and the it block is the spe actual spec. So this is just logging in to you know, a typical Drupal site. Um, you know, not as re re readable as the Gherkin uh, example I showed before, but pretty readable. I think everybody kind of gets, gets the idea of what's going on here. Going to a page, uh, getting some elements, typing, clicking. Uh, and then seeing that uh, you know you're actually logged in, you're not getting access tonight or some other kind of error. So I think pretty nice syntax, so uh, chainable commands. And then here we have because you don't want to then 
do that log in on every step or every test, right? Um, you might want to test that once through the UI. Uh, but this is adding a custom command. So you can add custom commands, but remember locality behavior. You don't want to try to add uh, too many because then someone trying to fix a test might try to look around all over the place and uh, get confused. So don't overdo it. But logging in is a very good uh, example. And so this uses also the size session uh, command. So when this runs in a test, it'll look for uh, you know, the key here, uh, admin, and if it finds it, then it'll just return it, it won't run the callback. If it doesn't find it, they'll run the callback and then uh, you know, store that in the session. And this is just another way of logging into a Drupal site with a request, which uh, I saw someone do a demo, it's like four times faster or something like that, but that was on whatever application they're using. Um, and so that's that's a good way to you know reuse that code and reuse the session, save you a lot of time logging, because uh, you'd probably be doing a lot of authenticated tests with Drupal. Um, and then importantly, you'll probably want this op option cache across specs because otherwise each uh, spec, each time a spec file is done, then it'll blow away and it'll log in again. Uh, Cypress has been getting a lot more with isolation, I think, to reduce some of the bugs that maybe they were having. So that's a bit on custom commands. And then here's just filling out an article node. So it's kind of a typical test you might write. Um, it's got uh, things like images in it. Uh, this is the default when you install Drupal 10, the node article. Um, selecting files, uploading uh, files, something you'll commonly do. Uh, filling out body fields. So this goes into CK Editor 5. And one thing to note, I was having a little bit of trouble, I think, with uh, clicking and typing because Cypress will sim simulate the events by default, but it has a really great um, community of plugins you can go and, and look. And this plugin, Cypress Real Events, um, actually does the native event. So sometimes if you know, you're having trouble with the default Cypress clicks and stuff, you can try that and real click, real type and they basically just put the word real before the uh, Cypress command. And also interestingly, I'll get into selectors uh, on the next slide, but it can be a bit a bit tricky uh, getting the proper selector that's not gonna break. Um, so I found it interesting that the tooltip text was actually the um, most reasonable thing for clicking on the buttons in the WYSIWYG. Um, and it makes it, you know, uh, when you're looking at the test, like you know what that is, um, like I said, you could try to abstract it, um, but I think that's uh, pretty pretty safe that they probably won't change uh, that uh, more than a lot of, yep. What's the difference between doing it this way versus posting to the form like you did for the login form? Uh, yeah, so this is more like, I guess you want to be really sure that it's working in a browser. Let's say you have a specific browser requirements, but yeah, I. I a lot of times you want to push it down to a lower level because it's faster. You could use a headless browser or something like that. Um, so yeah, I'll get into that a little later about trying to push things down a level. But if you want to be really sure, um, then I would say you want to do it as close to the, the user that's uh, you know, on your site. Yeah. Um, so, and then uh, just filling in the tags. Uh, so that how to create a couple tags, and you can you can also use these uh, key. There's like a few things you can put in there, like enter uh, to simulate an actual key without the key code. And so here is uh, selecting elements. Like I said, it can be a little bit tricky. Like what it, what do you pick to select? Um, so the recommendation, uh, best practice, is to use data attributes. And so Cypress says data side, but I like data test ID. Maybe sometime you're not going to use Cypress, uh, so it's a little more generic, um, and it's less brittle. So you can tell, uh, you know, developers like, hey, don't touch the data test ID attributes. Do whatever you want with the other attributes, but that'll help your test be more uh, stable and secure. Um, and I think you could probably do pre-processed template, pre-processed templating functions. Um, I haven't tried that, but that's what I thought I had to add uh, quickly data test ID with there was stuff to make it kind of easier to target. So that's maybe a project for someone to try out. And then asserting that uh, form input on the 
next page um, loads. And so this is going over some assertions. Um, so you can assert text on, on any uh, thing related to the previous uh, get. We're just using contains, although sometimes people like to be more specific with like should have text. Um, and these are try assertions, so there's a lot of different assertions you can have. Uh, can be visible, should not be visible, should have HTML, should not have HTML. Um, and then this is just going and getting the uh, tags, so this will get all of the you know selections there. And uh, this just goes through um, the first and then the second and make sure that what the word is in there is what I typed into the form element. Uh, previous like you can also write expectations like that I don't exactly uh, like it as much I kind of like the the syntax here but I you can do it both ways I would just say pick pick one in your development team and stick, stick to that and then uh, this is a little more advanced but something you should definitely use um, so aliases so one difficulty can be how do you you know like kind of share state uh, between tests or different parts of the test um, so this is an example just lifted from uh, their docs. Uh, so in this example, you're trying to get something, uh, and this is a life cycle hook, so you can have before, before each, after, after each, and uh, a spec file. And so this is getting button text, but then how you access it there. Uh, so this is one way uh, to do it. And um, this invoke command is just invoking the function on the previous, um, it's actually J jQuery elements. Um, and then you can access it uh, later. So this is something you might think of a selector that I don't, uh, you don't want to keep writing it. Uh, so it kind of gets into page objects a little bit. Um, but you can take that and then Cypress will actually run this each time. So it's important to note that it doesn't just run it once and it's a reference. So it helps with retriability so these aliases don't get stale. Um, but the neatest thing I think about Cypress I've gotten into so far is the intercept uh, command here. And so since Cypress is connected to the browser instance, uh, you can do anything you want with the request. Um, so this is just an example of, so let's say you have a decoupled site and you have the classic, uh, people probably say just use GraphQL, but this is a, a, just an example of kind of under underfetching. You get a list of things and you have to get the individual items. So an example, let's just say, for testing, you want to defeat in a smaller list. Um, this will look for this request from the front end application and then stub in this uh, data uh, as this uh, alias. Um, and then the second one actually lets it pass through. It's just, it's just um, keeping track of these requests for you. And so when you go to this page, you can actually wait for any of these to finish, so you don't have to have an arbitrary wait, um, or there's like a default four second wait, I think Cypress tries to retry getting elements. Um, and then so you can be assured that those requests have completed by the time you uh, run your assertion. So that was really neat. And another really cool thing, you could add headers. So if you have something in production that adds a bunch of crazy headers, which I, you know, I work on, uh, you know, reverse proxy caches, different things like that. But I was working on something where there was a language header that was uh, put in, and I, um, what this does is before the response is sent back, um, it adds this header. So if you have code that's looking for a specific header, but you're like, I don't want to connect to production or I can't, you can kind of fake stuff like that uh, without touching your application code, which is very useful. And the last example is just, uh, so if you don't put a get or anything like that, it'll listen for any any interaction. So this is, you know, you have a lot of Ajax with like Layout Builder, um, Media Browser, things like that. This will look for all of those and then wait for them to complete before it tries to get this iframe. Uh, so that can be very useful when you're working with Ajax requests and uh, testing that stuff. So a lot more in the network request guide. I, uh, I think you should use it. So that's uh, that's kind of going on service features. So now, what do you do? Uh, one of the uh, trickiest things is like how do you arrange your your test? Because that can be tricky when you're trying to onboard someone, tell them where to put the test, and they know how to write the test. So I think just for this contrived example, I'll just break it down too. 
Uh, you can have tests come from features. You can also certainly have tests come from bugs. Um, and so in your end-to-end -end folders, example you could have, uh, you could break it into these categories. So you could uh, take bugs and put them first into regressions. Uh, maybe a QA team member notices it and they're able to put it there for developers to look at, but maybe you don't want to try to figure out uh, where the test should actually go. Uh, feature, uh, you know, those can go into, these are basically Drupal user roles, but I think of user journeys and then done tests, uh, so you can split it out uh, kind of that way. Um, the creator of Cypress, Brian Mann, uh, gave a talk, and so this is how he split his out. Um, so he was saying it's by model, um, so that might not be that semantic for your your end users, your clients, uh, but it might work for you. Um, that's why I like uh, maybe trying to think of the user journeys you have and then putting your tests in there. Um, and you can also skip the tests, so you can write a test and use it skip, will, uh, or you can put an X in front of it and Cypress won't run the test. But this can be useful, right, where you know what the bug is, uh, you know maybe how to fix it, but you don't want the test to fail, so you just write it beforehand and then you just skip it uh, so you can let the other tests run. Um, same you can do with features when you're going over the sprint planning and stuff you can maybe start stubbing that stuff out and then uh, you know get to it later as you're implementing it. Uh, and then I would say though, I had a comment before, uh, what I would try to do is push the regressions into the user stories because you know the bug is always going to come from some kind of user doing something and something went wrong. Uh, so instead of just leaving it out on some kind of bug ticket. And then if you're repeating things in, in your future test, like try to go to a lower level probably because you can probably do it at a lower level. You don't uh, necessarily need to do everything uh, expensively at the highest level with a browser. Um, so here's an example of something that could be like a, a bug ticket. Um, I oftentimes like to uh, put the uh, link to the issue um, at the top because that kind of gives you more context as you're looking like what does this test do, why was it created. Um, so this just you know, kind of looks for a preview. This is kind of taken from um, actual uh, project. Um, but do people think this is a good good end-to-end -end test? Yeah, you know. Okay. I, I think it's not very because uh, I think that you could you put this into an actual user journey like why, why did this report it, why did the client say hey I can't do this, what were they doing? Uh, so I think it's you know okay to stick that in there um, but I would try to move it to an actual user journey so it kind of makes more sense because this really doesn't make sense to me like why as a user I would exactly be only doing this or probably doing it to like a uh, preview of change I'm making, uh, which can be part of another test. Um, here's another test taken from actual projects. Um, I don't exactly like it, but does anyone spot an, an error or issue that you could have with this? And uh, one issue is here, so you don't want to rely on the last test uh, for the next test stage. So let's say you know you don't. Uh, the title doesn't contain that for whatever reason. Um, you know this test will fail because it's expecting it to go to the belt page. Um, but this is common. I see people trying to do more kind of unit-like level tests where they're just kind of testing one thing, and then sometimes they are relying on the state last uh, test. Well, it's going to fail because you have a typo on line ten. So. Yeah, I do. Visit the spell drop. Yeah. Okay. I'll fix that next time. <laughs> It's a, a Italian movie. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I yeah. I would uh, I would combine them. Cypress has uh, you get a video recording, you get screenshots, you get really nice output. I've never had a problem with like where is the test failing. So I know in unit tests you can kind of do that because it's kind of harder harder to know where it's failing and whatnot. Um, but I would combine them and don't worry about you know your test growing longer as long as they're a reasonable you know test for a user journey, I think it's, it's fine. And that's in the Cypress docs as well. Um, here's just some examples of uh, some tests that I, I've written to show you. Uh, 
I think uh, one common thing you can have is uh, collections of things like nodes and maybe you're going through and kind of searching them and then you have individual you know, detail pages. So those are good things to test. Um, this is just uh, worked on a site where you were making donations. So uh, you can kind of see there's little uh, variables there like single or probably have a test that has uh, multiple donations and stuff. And it's sort of a run on run on sentence there, um, and you might want to break it up. But I think it's it's kind of fine to get into those edge cases as you're going through the test because eventually, once you have enough tests, people will go it's too slow, and they don't want to wait for all the feedback, so you'll have to start splitting them up. Uh, so I think that test kind of fine. And then the final one is with uh, query parameters. So this was the same uh, application, and it just uh, you know, loaded the query parameters and pre-populated a form. Uh, so this is kind of, kind of okay because this test covers the whole donations and this is, you know, the beginning of it. But I would push these tests probably to a lower level to hit this browser because you're not, you don't really need the expense of, of something like Cypress. Uh, it's going to be slower and you're not really doing the whole user journey. This is an example of dynamically creating tests. So you can have a test with data, it's, it's you know, uh, good to do this in some cases. Um, and this will uh, print out the actual username as it's logged in. Um, and then it's, it's kind of going through sort of like that uh, Gherkin scenario outline, a feature file I showed before. And just running through and uh, you know, making sure that uh, the assertions are correct. Uh, one thing to note, I, you do have some options when you visit, like this will fail unless you uh, because it's trying to help you out. Um, normally, if there's a 400 or non-200 errors, you want the test to fail. But sometimes you don't because you want to you want to see that uh, X is nine. But I would not I would not do this too often. I think one test suite I was running with had probably like 70 percent. Just like does this user can they get to this page or not? And once again, it's it's better to probably do it at a lower level. Like you can use PHP unit and the browser test base and then test this way. Uh, you're closer to PHP if you have to create users or content or whatever. Otherwise, you can kind of create a bridge I've done before with like an API endpoint to seed users and delete things, but then you gotta maintain that. Uh, so, you know, always be thinking how you can push stuff lower. And then downsides, I'm not gonna tell you it's all puppies and rainbows. Uh, there's some, some you know, uh, clouds and storms. So still no iframe support. Um, that links to an issue you can go, it's an old issue. Um, and yeah, so I, I will occasionally will go back here, see if there's new solutions, but I was uh, testing like a Twitter timeline widget, trying to make a test. And it's, a, it's annoying because Cypress will take a DOM snapshot and so you can go through the test runner and you'll see that when it's testing, it'll just be blank. But then you'll see the test complete, and, it'll, and you'll see what you want there, but then Cypress can't, you know, capture. Uh, so there's all this, like, trying to wait for stuff to load into the iframe, and you can go through and read the, the solutions there, but it's frustrating because some other tools have support right out of the box. And then it can't handle key cloaks. I still don't exactly know what those are, but this comes from a, a quality assurance Reddit, um, which is, once again, kind of, outside of my developer site, but a lot of those people use Selenium, a lot of them are like, screw Cypress, you know, they don't, they don't like it because, uh, you know, they have a lot of build-up solutions and they think that developers that use JavaScript just want to use it because they use JavaScript, it's sort of true. Um, but can't handle multiple tabs, multiple windows, so if you have applications with those needs, like maybe, maybe you want something different. Um, limited to JavaScript TypeScript, so that, that could be an advantage, but you know, with Drupal we have PHP, so maybe you want to be closer to that, that layer and use a lot of, or a lot of PHP uh, you know, based solutions. And then Playwright, like if you, I was typing in like versus, you know, Cypress versus, so Playwright comes up and that's another link to the Reddit um, sub-thread where somebody, and they're, they're trying, to, trying not to be biased, but they have all of these reasons that they want to use Playwright instead of Cypress. Um, so, you know, in closing, I think Cypress is, is a great tool. It's easy to use, uh, you know, as I was going through, you know, the BHAT stuff and all that trouble setting it up. I set up Cypress, ran, it's never failed me so far. And, um, 
So, but once you get into more of the weeds, like I'm going to look at playwright, uh, you know, uh, after doing this because I re researched Cyprus all, all I all I could want, um, and I you know does have downsides, but I like to see uh, playwright night watch. A lot of those are taking, uh, making it easier to you know uh, do some of the things Cyprus is doing, and I'm not sure if Cyprus can get around some of these multiple tabs, multiple windows stuff uh, people keep complaining about. And there's a couple images. Uh, once again, I work for Civic Actions, and uh, that's that's the end. And I go for any questions, or I also have uh, can go through the test runner or uh, some maybe more more advanced stuff and PHP Storm of a project open. But so do we do Q and A on here. Do I press the button? Um, yeah, just keep going for Q and A. And any questions? One the recording up here. Are these slides available somewhere? Yeah, if you go to the uh, session title, huh? Is it cash clear? Okay, cash clear, I guess. You gotta clear the cash. <laughs> yeah, the site's on the CDN, so it might. That's funny. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. do the query parameter. Yeah, do the query parameter. Yeah, cash flow. Uh, yeah, but the slides are on there. I included a lot of links, so please go, you know, check that out and check out the links. They have way more information. Okay. It's uh, we have any other questions? Yeah, it's, it, it, it's cached by CDN, so it'll it'll either either put some garbage query string on there or just wait a few minutes and the CDN will yeah, refresh but, it. But you're getting a two oh four. But uh any other questions? No? Okay. Um, as I said, we, I mean, we've mostly been using the hat when we need to do anything just because we often have so much set up, like we need, like the Drupal B hat integration, you know, is really helpful, it does a lot of stuff. Um, so we've been doing, yeah, at this point we're using both. Do you, have you moved totally away from B hat in favor of this? Uh. What all like? Do you have multiple tabs or a bunch of iframe? No. No. Um, what's the level of your like a team with testing? I mean, comfort. People are reasonably expert, but you know, it's the the, the hat. You know, it's like, well, we want to like make sure the data is there and that like. I mean, so we needed to sometimes populate a bunch of data in, so it's useful just to have direct access to the PHP API, which I don't. I don't know that the hat really can, or uh, Cypress can really do. No, I oftentimes will just run trush commands. Yeah. So you just make a Cypress trush command and then just run it that way. Yeah. Because uh, you can can do it that way. Or I'll make like a, like this like custom testing module or something and then put an API endpoint to see the data. Um, but yeah, that, that can be tricky. Um, I'd also, like I said, uh, maybe uh, check out Playwright or uh, Nightwatch. Because um, they've been adding a lot of a lot of features. Uh, I think Cypress has a pretty good marketing division and whatnot. Um, so I've definitely seen it a lot, um, especially if you follow JavaScript. Because uh, you know, if you're for JavaScript, you can actually you know spy on functions and stuff like that. So um, that's you know more helpful with code coverage. Where that's one of the tricky things with end-to-end -end tests is code coverage, uh, because. Yeah, like you're if you don't if you're not on the target platform, then you just have to come up with some kind of other metric for am I testing the code that I have on my website? Um, so I don't know if you have any time left. Rat rat time. I was going to show the the test runner, but I I will put a minute. <laughs> what? You got a minute? Okay. Uh, well, just real quickly, this is, some, this is something I figured out, uh, but this is a GitHub action uh, on a pull request, uh, two split up into tags, so one of the one of the difficulties you can have is splitting up a test into tag. So this uses um, a dependency Cypress split, um, and this is done by one of the uh, main contributors, Cypress, and then he left, and so he has all these uh, dependencies. But, um, I was able to, and I'll, I'll put this on the session, I guess, so you can follow it. 
but I was able to, uh, with this script, um, split up the uh, tags by commit message um, using a hash symbol and then uh, later on uh, running the test. If it has tags, it runs the tags. If it doesn't, then it just runs smoke test. So that's something that you'll you end up once you have enough tests, you'll start splitting them up because people complain that it runs uh, too long. And so you can have a commit message, uh, like get commit, uh, whatever you're doing, and then hash, and then the tags that you want. Um, and that's a way to conditionally do things. You can also think of other flags you might want to, to put in there. Um, but just wanted to show that because that, that was a little tricky and I'll, I'll put a link to this repo on the uh, on the project but I, I usually have a, a module that I install before I run a test that sets up users and stuff like that um, and add some other routes. So, so thanks.